now being recorded. And I'm delighted today to be joined by um, Carmen Rulan of the Center for Education Equity at the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Welcome, Carmen. We're also going to be joined by um, two colleagues from uh, State Departments of Education who are doing um, especially interesting equity work. And we'll introduce a few to them shortly. Uh, just a couple of logistical matters. Uh, please note that the audio portion of today's webinar is only available by phone um, out of respect for those of you uh, who may not have terrific broadband access. Um, when you logged in, if you did not choose to have the webinar system call you, please use the following toll-free number um, for audio. Kim Cook, could you please um, find that number and mute it? That would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so the number to call in, if you didn't have the system call you, is 877-423-6338, and the passcode is 142-587-pound sign, and that information is also in the chat box. Um, this is also a reminder that if you are not speaking, to please mute your phone so that we can hear the presenters clearly. Thank you very much. Um, again, welcome to today's webinar, and I'm really excited to welcome today's uh, speakers. Uh, Carmen Verland oversees the uh, Center for Education Equity at uh, the Mid-Atlantic Equity Assistance Consortium. She uh, leads CEE's technical assistance portfolio, where she also delivers technical assistance and training on racial equity, cultural competence, and family, school, and community engagement. So welcome, Carmen. We're really glad to have you today. Um, also joining us is Beth Olinoff, who is Special Assistant to the Secretary of Education at the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, she's charged with the development and implementation of the state's consolidated state plan under the Federal ESSA Act. Uh, and finally, we're joined by Paul Fleming, who is the Assistant Commissioner for the Teachers and Leaders Division at the Tennessee Department of Education. Uh, this division is responsible for designing, implementing, evaluating, and support of uh, policies, practices, and programs that are related to all aspects of teacher and leader preparation, institutions, licensure, evaluation and development, and educator talent. So we're, we're delighted to hear from Paul as well today. Uh, now we'll tell you a little bit about each of our respective organizations uh, very quickly. The Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center, otherwise known as the ARC, serves four states, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. We are commissioned by the U.S. Department of Education to provide technical assistance to state departments of education principally uh, to build and enhance their capacity to undertake important reforms. So that's us. Carmen, will you tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Center for Education and Equity is one of four uh, regional um, equity assistance centers funded by the U.S. Department of Education under Title IV of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Center um, for Education and Equity is a partnership with WestEd and the American Institute um, for Research, as well as the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Our, um, we are the Region 1 Equity Assistance Center. Our, the states in our region, Connecticut, Delaware, Kentucky, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, Vermont, um, the Virgin Islands, and West Virginia. So quite, quite a few states um, that, we, uh, that we oversee um, technical assistance for. Our goals are to improve and sustain the systemic capacity of public education systems to address problems caused by segregation and inequities, and also to increase equitable educational opportunities for all students, regardless of race, gender, religion, and national origin. We provide technical assistance and training to state, school districts, uh, schools, and community-based organizations within our region at the request of school boards and other responsible um, governmental agencies. 
So to begin, um, our, our talk today is around equity and the Every Student Succeeds Act and how that particular piece of legislation or law now, how that um, allows states to and districts um, to think about uh, opportunities around providing equitable education for students. And so as we begin talking about equity in ESSA, we thought it would be a great idea to just have you all in the chat box respond to this particular question. And this is an image I know that's been out for a while and, and something that we like to start our trainings off with. But when you see this image of the three people standing on crates on one side and then on the other side there's a different distribution of uh, resources, what comes to mind? So just take a few moments to type within that chat box. Thank you. So someone wrote equal versus equitable. Mm -hmm. Fairness is not always equal equity. Meet people where they are. Equity does not mean equality and vice versa, so some of the same um, summaries there. And then also it's more um, important or fun to play than watch. So how can we get people in the game? Thank you. Equal does not mean equitable. Many times we speak of ensuring resources and human capital are equally distributed and that does not always mean it is appropriate to the needs. Um, and then someone said, well, where are the girls? Which, <laughs> if we really want to break down equity, thank you, Phyllis. Um, and all students' um, needs are met. So thank you. Thank you for in indulging us with that and participating. We try to make our webinars a little bit interactive. You know, it's hard to do so. Um, but, but thank you for that. And I, you, you guys are spot on. Um, and, and as you said, equality means everyone receives the same resources, opportunities, and support. And equity is where we meet each person where she or he is, utilizes, um, and builds on their strengths and ensures everyone receives what they need to thrive. Um, thank you uh, again so much for that. And when we think about meeting everyone where they are, and here's back to the picture, equality on the left side, equity on the, the right side, um, we see that this is where our work um, where our work is. How do we ensure equity and how do we um, how do we reach or get to a common understanding um, that not everyone receives the same thing um, in order to meet their needs. And um, as districts and as uh, state education agencies, as educators, as principals, um, how do we bring everyone along to that same understanding? So that's where we wanted to start with a brief overview of equity as we start talking about policy, and in particular, the Every Student Succeeds Act and how that provides opportunity um, for equity. And when we think about equity in reality, um, it means that our intentions often do not translate into culturally sustaining equitable impact, but if we think about equity through liberation, that means that Everyone in the system has a responsibility to make sure that systems and policies and practices are put in place that empower everyone, regardless of their background, their language, their SES status, their race, um, that everyone's needs are met and that we operate from a, a place of um, empowerment. And as someone just pointed out in, that, in the right-hand picture, when you have liberation, there's no wall. Right, so everyone's able to see that game and participate. Um, okay, I'll get off my horse now, <laughs> my soapbox, <laughs> and move on. So MAP, the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consor Consortium, operates um, from a perspective of data-driven, outcome-focused equity framework. And so our framework that you see on this slide really 
um, tries to outline the areas that are typically acknowledged as critical levers to improving student outcomes. Um, so we have equitable systemic policies, procedures, and practices. There are, there are positive and inclusive school climate. Um, students have access to, all students have access to rigorous, rigorous curriculum. We're engaging families and communities, and we're coming from an a, a, um, asset-based approach, and then we're creating effective partnerships that build positive youth development. And so we believe that those are the technical areas of the work, things that should be considered, but there's also adaptive areas of the work. And when you're talking about policy, it's important to, to consider social dimensions of change, um, where both cultural identities of school, staff, state district leaders, community um, are, uh, are thought through collaboration and problem solving, um, structural dimensions of change, so those are the institutional barriers, communication, teaming, collaboration structures, data management systems, professional learning opportunities that sometimes prevent schools from providing students with equal opportunities to learn. And then there's the material dimensions of change. And so when you think about ESSA, thinking about resource allocation um, and distribution of, of funds, um, curricular materials, what is our curriculum, um, is it culturally responsive, um, talent investment, how are we recruiting and retaining effective teachers and leaders, um, and how are we developing those folks. That all ties into the Every Student Succeeds Act and some of the things that you'll hear um, later on in the presentation from um, Beth and Paul from Pennsylvania and Tennessee as they talk about the things that they're doing in their respective states uh, there. And then if we think about how we oper operationalize equity in particular policies and practices, um, I'm not going to read all of these examples to you, but just some that really stick out, um, starting with trust and relationships and building that shared responsibility and accountability um, in our districts and our families as schools work together with families, um, making sure that we're implementing policies and practices that open pathways to academic excellence for all students. Um, situating learning in the lives of students and their families, facilitating high-level critical thinking and decision-making, building educator efficacy and capacity in a variety of equity and social justice contexts. Um, I might as well, I'm reading all of them. <laughs> and, um, and integrating prerequisites for academic learning and efficiency. Uh, so I'm stopping there. I think I'm turning it back over to, to Caitlin um, to, to really go in-depth in ESSA, but um, thank you. Thank you, Cartman. And this is just, I'll take this opportunity to remind folks that if you're not speaking, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you would go ahead and mute your line. Um, and of course, anytime you want to add something or have a question or comment or observation, please unmute yourself and jump in. We're, we're in formal rounds here, but we would prefer it if you'd uh, mute your phone uh, until you speak. So um, what is ESSA? Uh, well, we think that it's really useful to acknowledge and recognize that ESSA is essentially uh, a civil rights law with clear roots in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, which emerged in the context of the civil rights movement um, and Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty, which sought to alleviate, alleviate uh, some of the worst discrepancies in people's life chances. Um, the original ESEA uh, focused on closing uh, opportunity and funding gaps, largely by um, providing monies for professional development, instructional materials, and education programs, particularly in high poverty schools. Um, there were early amendments as um, uh, stakeholders in Congress recognized that there were other um, inequities that required redress in the law, um, particularly special education students and English learners. Um, the original law also um, introduced the notion of standards and accountability as a mechanism for ensuring equity um, at the uh, federal level, using federal levers, levers of power. Um, Originally, uh, five-sixths of funding, of uh, the funding for 
DSEA went to Title I, which was essentially um, monies for uh, supplementing the education of students in poverty or in otherwise under-resourced places who did not have access to the instructional uh, supports that students in wealthier schools and districts did. Um, it's important to note, too, that the No Child Left Behind Act, which reauthorized ESEA, added requirements that um, states, districts, and schools report academic outcomes disaggregated by student sub subgroups. So for the first time, we had a um, national view of how student subgroups were performing um, over time. Uh, the equity components of ESSA um, are in some ways continuous with those from the No Child Left Behind Act and in some ways are quite different. So I'm going to give a high level kind of overview of what those are. Um, as you saw in No Child Left Behind, subgroup reporting is still required. All states, schools, and districts must report how students in various uh, categories are performing. Um, so, for example, how are African American students performing? How are English learners performing, et cetera? Um, in a move that sort of acknowledges that reality and effective effectiveness are very complex and social. Um, the ESSA has permitted the uh, use of new indicators and measures of success. So for example, rather than only hinging on academic performance, states may also require districts and schools to report on other indicators of school-wide effectiveness, such as school climate, for example. Another important equity component of ESSA concerns the equitable distribution of effective teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and the details of this have changed, but it continues to be an important focus and, of course, also harkens back to the um, teacher equity plans that states were required to submit in years prior to the Department of Education. But the idea here is that um, students access to strong teachers should not be determined by zip code. Um, another equity component, it concerns addressing resource gaps. There are, um, as you're probably aware, large funding um, discrepancies between districts um, based on things like uh, property tax, for example. Um, as one lever for ensuring that we have a really clear picture of how states are funding, how districts are funding their schools, how states are funding their districts, there are new requirements that states report per pupil spending um, at the district and school level. This is new, it's complicated, it may be controversial, but nonetheless it is a new lens on how uh, resources are spent and what kinds of gaps arise. Another equity component of ESSA concerns evidence-based practices for those schools requiring improvement support from states or districts. Uh, this is an attempt to assure that um, those schools in need receive the very best kinds of interventions um, and there is um, room in the evidence-based uh, tiers in the law for um, the implementation and study of practices that seem promising but may not have been implemented in the kinds of schools that are in particular need of support. So um, there is flexibility there for schools and districts to find those interventions that um, have some evidence, but also um, to align those uh, interventions with their local context. Another important equity component is stakeholder involvement. There was quite a re requirement in ESSA that states actively, meaningfully engaged a, a, engage a wide range of stakeholders in their planning for implementation of ESSA, um, bringing people back into the public conversations about purpose and form of education. 
And finally, um, another equity component of ESSA concerns accountability. Um, how will states hold schools accountable? And related, how will they provide support to those schools found to be in need of assistance? Um, there are new accountability requirements for English learning, uh, English learners in acknowledgement that um, such students are increasingly important. Um, they're increasingly growing, and we need to allocate uh, attention and resources to their support. Now we're going to focus on just a few of these and go into them in a little bit more detail, kind of to set you up for the good stuff that's coming from Pennsylvania and Tennessee as they talk about their own equity work. So um, this next slide is Carmen's, and she's going to talk about uh, these four equity components of ESSA. Yes, and not to belabor any points, because Caitlin really did a good job of outlining um, the components of ESSA. Uh, but there are, you know, certain provisions that definitely will help states and districts um, forge pathways, pathways towards equity, one of being the disaggregated data by subgroup. Um, ESSA asks that each district and state collect and report data on outcomes for all students, um, disaggregated, disaggregated by subgroup, um, thinking about that data and how and examining outcomes related to students with disabilities, um, military, students from military families, um, students experiencing homelessness and students uh, in foster care, for instance, um, those are some of the disaggregated subgroups that ESSA um, requires states to report out on. Um, support for equitable access to quality education for students experiencing homelessness. So there are a lot of support, a lot of uh, um, uh, things that states are obligated to do and districts are obligated to do in order to serve students. Um, en enhances that were made specifically to the McKinney-Vento Act um, uh, under ESSA, or when ESSA came along. Um, also, accountability, accountability goals and indicators of growth. Uh, giving states the option and districts the option to um, think about how they are measuring um, success and um, adding indicators of growth uh, for students, especially in elementary and middle schools, um, is something that ESSA came up, that came about with ESSA, and you'll hear a lot more about that um, during our um, state presentation. And then finally, um, Caitlin mentioned that uh, ESSA allowed, you know, the, gave some resources around effective um, uh, retention and recruitment, but also there are a lot of uh, flexibility within ESSA for states to um, provide professional development of teachers and leaders and some of those um, resources can be used to um, help uh, educators and staff and, and administrators um, think about culturally responsive um, approaches, cultural competency, and other areas of um, equity and racial equity when it comes to um, educating all students and providing um, an equitable education for all students. So we just wanted to call some of those initiatives out and um, or elements out um, as we get ready to hear from our state. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I'm briefly going to overview um, some of the uh, equity components of the equitable distribution of teachers requirements associated with um, ESSA. Uh, I'm going to also explicitly make the link to the state teacher equity plans that the U.S. Department of Education required in 2015 because um, Interestingly, uh, these showed up in ESSA plans as well, as they, sh as they ought to have. Um, one big change in the new requirements is that there is no longer a highly qualified teacher requirement, and states are no longer required to define and monitor what that is. On the other hand, states are required to report on ineffective teachers. So, you know, how are they distributed uh, across districts by various demographic characteristics, et cetera. Um, you know, there are certainly an array of ways in which this can be defined. It can be defined by, you know, the percentage of, of teachers who are uh, inexperienced, teaching out of field, have provisional or emergency credentials. In any case, this is a, 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 um, a tweak, um, a different way of slicing um, how we identify how um, teachers are distributed across schools. Um, and states have proposed a variety of ways of doing that. 
Um, secondly, uh, states are required to evaluate, monitor, and report their, distribu their distribution of uh, effective teachers across schools and districts. Um, again, uh, this is principally an accountability and monitoring sort of um, strategy. However, um, there's also money in Title II Part A that can be applied to more active strategies to ensure that teachers are equitably distributed. Um, and these monies can be used for uh, recruitment, for ensuring diverse uh, teachers, uh, for mentoring, for induction programs, and professional development. And so um, clearly the uh, law sees that teacher equity um, can be enhanced, can be strengthened via um, training and support. So one thing that I want to uh, uh, mention here is that um, I'm going to go back a slide. Uh, there are some uh, components of this particular uh, um, work that uh, concern leadership and leadership development, and we'll hear more about that from Paul Fleming from the Tennessee Department of Education when he discusses his state's Leaders for Equity playbook. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, Leaders for Equity can include and should include teachers and not just principals and superintendents. So we're looking first forward to hearing um, uh, from him. But first, I'm really delighted to introduce to you Beth Olanoff, who um, cannot unfortunately be seen because her camera is uh, not, not behaving today. So we'll enjoy her disembodied voice uh, in, in that case. Um, but she's going to describe today how her state uses the new indicators of success afforded by um, ESSA to understand the equity landscape in her state, to identify schools in need of assistance, and then to both support and hold them accountable. So, Beth, um, this is all yours. Caitlin, thank you very much. Uh, and first, let me say that I would like to thank the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center and the Center for Education and Equity for giving us the opportunity to share with folks uh, some of the work that we're doing here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I bring greetings, of course, from Secretary Pedro Rivera, uh, uh, who's been an integral part of our ESSA work and our equity work. And in fact, this year, he is president of CCSSO, which is the, um, Council, the Council for Chief State School Officers. And uh, I know that equity is high on his list of the work that CCSSO will be doing. Um, so let's just get started with how Pennsylvania has approached ESSA in general to begin with. Uh, this slide is a quote that we have right in our uh, ESSA plan. Uh, noting that ESSA provided Pennsylvania with the opportunity mm -hmm. to accelerate important reforms that predate ESSA's enactment. We were already working on some of these things, and, and I'll call that out as we go through. Um, and continuing transitioning education policy here in Pennsylvania away from a strict focus on compliance uh, and towards the establishment of rigorous expectations for students and collaboration and assistance for schools to help them meet this standard. We focused on guiding the following guiding principles uh, in our ESSA work, transparency, equity, and innovation. Transparency, of course, means multiple transparent and easy to understand indicators of school success. And again, I'll call those out as we look at three examples of our equity strategy. Um, equity, of course, is what we're talking about here. And that is probably the primary premier goal of ESSA and, of course, a goal for us here in Pennsylvania as well. And innovation in teaching and learning in schools and classrooms. Uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, uh, we were uh, asked to kind of focus on, on picking out three of the biggest equity strategies in our plan. And so we're focusing on our Future Ready PA Index, which is a brand new public facing with card. Um, new indicators, uh, new way of presenting the data. Uh, we're using a dashboard format instead of uh, a single summative score or even even a, um, uh, you know, a range of scores like an, like an A to F schedule. Um, in addition, we've, we have substantial, I think some, I'm getting distracted by hearing somebody else's voice. If you're, if you're not me, could you mute? Thank you. 
Um, the annual meeting for differenti oh. differentiation, we've increased the emphasis on growth vis-a-vis uh, -vis performance, and I think that that has a, uh, uh, an important equity aspect to it. And both of our new uh, school success, student success and school quality indicators uh, promote equity. We have a, a career-ready indicator that goes all the way down into elementary school uh, to help schools pay attention to the importance of presenting uh, career readiness and co career awareness content. And chronic absenteeism, of course, many states are using chronic absenteeism, uh, and we know that a big difference between chronic absenteeism and attendance is identifying the individual students who are not in, the, in their seat enough of the time. And then uh, beyond the plan, the responsibility would fall on individual schools to figure out once those students are identified how to address the barriers that are keeping them from attending on a regular basis. Uh, and finally, the third uh, equity strategy that I'd like to highlight is something that I think is very innovative here in Pennsylvania, and that is uh, the Secretary's Superintendent Academy. Uh, this is a two-year cohort-based program. We had almost 100 uh, superintendents and charter school leaders sign up um, in the first cohort, which is just coming to an end now. Uh, the goal was to let these school and system leaders sit down and work together on strategies um, and change strategies that would raise the bar for all okay. students in their district to enable them to be college and career ready. So we'll go into a little more detail on each of these items. So what is the Future Ready PA Index? Well, that's the fancy word for uh, our new school report card here in Pennsylvania. Early in 2015, before ESSA was enacted, uh, newly elected Governor Tom Wolf charged the Department of Education with developing a more holistic school progress report. The existing forward-facing progress report uh, was developed by the previous administration, very reliant on test scores. It did use growth, but uh, proficiency had a heavier weight, and there weren't too many other kinds of indicators. So uh, the new governor was, um, was dissatisfied with that and charged the secretary with coming up with a new way, using test scores, but not only test scores, to see how schools were doing at preparing students for post-secondary success. So charged with that responsibility by the new governor, the new secretary, uh, charged uh, employees at PDE to get out in the field and conduct a very wide-ranging stakeholder engagement process to capture ideas and discussion about what would be the appropriate measures of success beyond test scores. And we had superintendents and principals and parents and lots of different kinds of people sitting down and really discussing um, what, what was appropriate to measure, what were barriers to successful measurement. Um, we kicked around uh, school climate a lot, but how do you measure that? Um, lots of different uh, things to discuss. Um, by the end of the spring, we had spoken uh, at more than 10 different uh, full-day listening sessions across the Commonwealth. We have a big Commonwealth um, with 500 school districts. So it, it's always a challenge to get into the field and, and let everybody have a turn uh, to participate. Um, and over 1,000 stakeholders participated in that activity. Um, then ESSA was enacted in December 2015, almost a year later than our work had begun. And we were very gratified to see that ESSA was heading in the direction of transparency and a broader set of indicators, which was exactly what we had already begun to do. So future ready indicators. This, this is actually the list of the indicators that we are measuring and will report on uh, school by school uh, not the future ready itself is about schools, but of course ESSA requires LEA reporting as well. So we will have both for all of these measures. We've divided them into three chapters uh, as a matter of organization. State assessment measure, on track, what we call on track measures, and college and career readiness measures. So under state assessment, you see the usual suspects, percent proficient in advance on our state standardized exam which are PSSAs in, in grades three through eight, and keystone exams uh, in uh, the high school years, um, and meeting growth expectations. And here in Pennsylvania, we use something called the Pennsylvania 
value-added assessment system. Um, many states use that, including Tennessee, who's coming up next. Um, both of those things are also ESSA accountability measures. The next measure, percent advanced on TSSA and Keystone, is not an, an ESSA accountability measure, but we think it's important. And some of you may have seen in, in, in the past couple of weeks some discussion in both the education and the popular press about the excellence gap um, and how in the past few years uh, schools and education systems have focused on the bottom tier of kids, which is certainly valid, but not necessarily valid to the exclusion of the top tier of kids. And how are we moving kids um, from uh, proficient to advanced? How are we taking the kids um, that are ready to move on to more rigor and ensuring that uh, they get the challenges that they need? So per percent advanced um, measures that. And of course, all of these measures would be disaggregated by sub On track measures, English language proficiency and ESSA accountability factor, chronic absenteeism, our, one of our new state selected indicators for um, ESSA accountability. This third one, grade three reading and grade seven math, is a voluntary indicator. LEAs get to decide if they want to report this data. And this is to give them the opportunity, if they're using a different assessment, they still have to use the standardized test, but if they're using an additional different assessment for grade three reading and grade seven math, we wanted to give them the opportunity to demonstrate that, to show that data on the public facing school and LEA report card. So that's what, that's what that is. And of course, why did we choose grade three and grade seven in those two subject areas? Well, research shows that uh, reading on grade level at grade three is uh, a gateway indicator. Kids who are, are not reading on grade level are going to struggle down the road. So that's a place to focus. And similarly with grade seven math, kids who've mastered grade seven math are, are positioned to go on uh, and take the more advanced mathematical concepts in algebra. The next chapter, college and career measures. Graduation rate, of course, is a, an ESSA accountability uh, measure. One of our equity, uh, equity strategies regarding graduation rate is that we are adding in the fifth year cohort in addition to the fourth year cohort. So that allows a school or an LEA to demonstrate, show data uh, that has afforded students a little bit more time to graduate. Um, we wanted to use the greater of fourth or fifth, but USDE was very stickler for the statutory language that said fourth. They did allow us to average the two rates. So our data will be, for accountability at least, will be an average of the four-year cohort and the fifth-year cohort. Um, our career standards benchmark, that is our other uh, student success and school quality indicator. Um, and again, this is a, a reporting of how many students have uh, have acquired certain evidences of activity. So this is really a prod to uh, schools and districts to implement curricular activities that uh, deliver and align with something with career, education, and work standards. We actually have those standards, um, and we've had them for a long time, but there was no uh, accountability created to them. So we weren't following after schools and districts to see how well they were delivering this important content. So that's what this is. Um, this is a, met, a way to hold them accountable. And while there's been a little grumbling, we're, we're already collecting this data this year, and while there's been a little grumbling just about what constitutes the data that we're going to collect, um, by and large, superintendents and school boards and teachers are very excited about this prod to add this career exploration activity um, uh, as a requirement into the, to the school year. Um, many states are using some sort of career readiness benchmark, but Pennsylvania, as far as we know, is the only state to push the data collection down into the elementary years. There are certainly career exploration activities that can start as young as kindergarten, and we think that that's important, and so this is the, the indicator that um, addresses that. Industry-based learning uh, is a new indicator uh, that shows kids access to several different kinds of industry-based learning, um, including high-value industry certificates, but also workplace experiences and internships and that sort of thing. 
Um, post-secondary transition to school, military, or work. ESSA requires an accounting of post-secondary transition to school, but we've added military or work as well. A little bit of a, uh, a data challenge. Um, military is not hard, but work is. Um, especially when our Department of Education uses the Pennsylvania Secure ID and the Department of Labor and Industry uses a social. So that's been a challenge, but um, we're working on that, and we hope to be successful at being able to report post-secondary transition to work. Um, and finally, under this chapter is access to rigorous courses of study, and that's AP, ID, um, and uh, dual enrollment opportunities. Again. The opportunity there is to encourage districts and schools um, to make more of those opportunities available because, you know, trans the, the um, uh, idea that transparency will promote more of this, these initiatives that we think are important. Parents will look at the report card on rigorous courses of study, for example, and say, whoa, wait a minute, why does my high school only have six AP courses? But, you know, down, down the road or elsewhere in the district there are more, or even other districts have more, what's going on and why are my schools not affording my kids those opportunities? So this next slide is actually the same slide showing you the future ready indicators, but highlighting the indicators that are our accountability indicators as well, the ones that we use for annual meaningful differentiation and identification of schools that need improvement. So uh, this just uh, highlights for you um, which how ESSA overlaps with our future ready report card, but how our report card goes a little farther um, than the ESSA requirement. And of course, the, those of you uh, sharp-eyed out there will realize that there are also some ESSA reporting requirements that are not included here on the future ready indicator. And we will have those on a linked uh, ESSA report card. This is a very important concept. Um, we will be presenting the Future Ready Index as a dashboard rather than uh, summing, giving values to each of the indicators and summing them up into a single score, which is what our previous report card did. And what we found with the previous report card on a scale of 1 to 100 is that communities, school boards, newspapers didn't look beyond the 85 or the 92.3 or the 97.6. And very competitive, but based on the summative score, not competitive based on um, access to high rigor or number of kids who went on to post-secondary education or training or a focus on how uh, individual subgroups were doing. And we felt very strongly that um, using the dashboard maximized the transparency of performance on individual measures and certainly performance of subgroups on individual measures. A summative score, um, as it says in the bullets under there, uh, actually masks poor subgroup performance. If a particular district is doing well, but they have a couple of subgroups that, that may or may not have very many kids, but those subgroups are not performing well, nobody's even going to pay attention to that if they are sort of distracted um, by a single summative score or the grade of an overall grade of B or A. Um, we think that uh, this helps treat the accountability system as a tool for continuous improvement. Um, you are putting in front of your community on a regular basis the individual data points rather than, again, hiding poor performance with a single summative score. So um, we're one of only a few states that have done this. We received a fair amount of pushback. Um, interestingly, not from the field. Uh, the pushback came more from um, the General Assembly uh, and some advocacy groups. Um, but the field was very happy to uh, have a dashboard format, and uh, they are looking for our help in uh, communicating it to their constituencies. It's, it's confusing. It's harder to master than a single summative score. But we think that the end result um, is uh, important enough to go through that work. So the next uh, of the big three of our equity strategies is how we're using data um, and how we're mixing and, and uh, evaluating our data for the purposes of annual meaningful differentiation and identification of schools that need improvement. 
So this is just repetition of what we've just seen before. Um, the first four indicators are required by ESSA, achievement on our test scores, academic progress using our growth system, graduation rate, and EL proficiency. The new indicators that were chosen by Pennsylvania, again, are the career readiness benchmark and chronic absenteeism. So how do we put all of those, these indicators here into the met, what I call the methodology box and shake up all these different indicators to identify schools that need improvement? So this is our, our favorite scatter plot chart. Every Title I school is on this chart, or obviously will be. So the axes here are proficiency and growth. So if you end up, you as a Title I school, end up in the lower left quadrant, low proficiency and low growth, you move to the next step. If you're in one of the other three, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but if you're in one of the other three quadrants, for the purposes of identification as a CSI school, you can sit down. So again, only the schools that fall into the quadrant of low proficiency and low growth move to the next step. Here's the next step. First, we, we add in the two substantially weighted indicators, and that definition is in the statute, and it's high school graduation and progress in, in moving English learners to proficiency. If you are in step two, which means you're low growth, low proficiency, and you have either one of these, you will be identified as a CSI school, a school in need of improvement. If you have neither of those, and in other words, you're doing okay with these two indicators, then you move to the, to the next part B of step two, which is the school quality student success indicators of chronic absenteeism and career readiness. You have to have both of those. And the reason for that is that's how we have to make the first two substantially weighted. Again, this, this differentiation was required by the department. All right, that's pretty confusing. So in our plan and in our presentations, we offer what, what I call the Christmas tree chart for obvious reasons. So this on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see examples of school configurations. These are not real schools. They're just types, like a K-5 to school and the English language subgroup meets the end size, so, and our end size is 20. So obviously you don't even look at EL progress if the end size for EL is, um, doesn't meet the end size. So uh, they're green for EL, which means they're doing okay, and they don't have a graduation rate because they're a to five school. So we don't need to look at substantially weighted indicators. We move to school quality student success. They're okay on chronic absenteeism, but not career readiness. You need two there so they're not CSI. All right, I'm not going to go through all of the uh, Christmas tree chart. It's just a way for schools to kind of see, you know, find their configuration, and if they are low growth and low performance, how we would calculate whether or not they're a CSI school. Okay? Um, all right, before I get to separate, Secretary of Superintendent's Academy, so let me go back here. So we can't run these numbers yet. Of course, everybody in the state, advocacy groups and the unions and um, the schools themselves want to know if they're going to be identified as a CSI school. Well, we can't tell them yet because much of the data, the indicators, is only just coming in now. So we haven't, we're not able to identify low growth and low performance. And we're not able to identify um, who fits where in the other indicators either. And oh, by the way, since ultimately we are looking for only 5% of the bottom Title I schools, we don't know exactly where the axes are yet. We have to fiddle with them so that when we apply the data, we generate ultimately 5% of the Title I schools. So that's a little hard for people to understand, but that's where we are, and we will work the data over the summer, and our expectation is that sometime in the fall, um, one, will release the data in the form of the Future Ready PA Index, but we will also then be able to, uh, a little bit later, release the, the uh, identities 
of the schools that, that are uh, targeted for CSI and, of course, also targeted for TSI, um, which, as I'm assuming most people on this call know, um, will apply the same system to subgroups and any school with a subgroup that would meet the CSI uh, requirements would, would be tagged with the TSI label. Okay, I can't see your faces. I can't see whether you're confused, but I'm hoping you're following along. And now we'll go to the superintendent's academy. So this is a strategy that also started before. Um, and, and this strategy fits into the professional development uh, that helps leaders um, be equipped to deliver uh, equitable programs and uh, focus on strategies to improve equity, equity in their buildings, especially for uh, buildings that have high percentages of high poverty children. So the goal is to engage the superintendents in the work of improving in achievement, um, particularly where the challenges of poverty uh, are significant barriers. It's a two-year cohort-based program. Obviously, cohort-based means we, we bring them together on a regular basis, and they work together, and they learn from each other, and some of them even develop their, uh, as the next bullet talks about, their action learning projects. And these are specific projects that each superintendent, or sometimes they coalesce into groups, um, work on together, very specific, uh, to address a, a specific issue um, in their school or community. So we'll see uh, some examples of that in a moment. Seventy-three uh, participants com <coughs> completed the two years of cohort one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just recently in May uh, 2018, cohort two began um, in September 2017. So uh, they're completing their first year, and cohort three is being planned. Um, has been approved, and, and they found some funding in the couch cushions, I think, to uh, to support it. <laughs> Um, other states have, have taken a look and have come to see what we're doing. Um, we are in partnership with the National Institute of School Leadership doing this work. And here, let's take a quick look at, at, at some of the, um, some of the uh, ALPS, as they're called, action learning plans that uh, the folks in Cohort 1 developed. So the first one is a system of professional learning communities across districts. So here, we, as I said earlier, we have 500 districts in Pennsylvania. In some places, the school districts are countywide, in Maryland, for example, but we're not countywide. In the county I live in, for example, there are 13 districts. Um, in, in Philadelphia, conversely, Philadelphia is its own uh, county and is a single district. So we have a wide variety of configurations. So this small group of multiple districts um, is working together to develop a system of learning communities across the districts to achieve job-embedded professional development. Another little group in a county um, is establishing a county-wide first-day ready principal credential um, for their own little credential so that among those districts, um, they can uh, uh, work together to apply the requirements that they feel are important for uh, post-certification but pre-employment candidates to be building principals. Um, Another single uh, charter school leader has a, a project to transform her school into a high-performing STEM academy, working through um, a community partnership model. Another app is, is for a school leader to work with families and community partners to ensure, and here's a, here's a specific issue, to ensure that all of her students are reading on grade level by age eight. And finally, the last example here is to eliminate the grade and age level determinants for access to high rigor math coursework. That's a great equity strategy because, um, again, as we talked earlier about high performing kids, uh, um, there are many biases um, against uh, minority children um, and poor children as to whether they're capable of high rigor coursework. And so this is at least one step to looking at the, at the student rather than to checking off boxes to see whether students should be eligible for um, high-level math coursework in elementary school or even taking algebra um, on an accelerated basis in middle school. So as I said, we've gotten some um, very uh, uh, high marks for this from our um, the participants. 
and I'm hoping that we're going to figure out um, a strategy for evaluation. I think it will be hard to do um, objective evaluation, you know, in terms of measuring whether test scores or, or things um, increase following uh, uh, participation in the academy or implementation of the action learning plans, but the softer evaluations that we're getting from participants um, have been very good. So that's the end of my presentation, um, and I'm going to put the link to uh, Pennsylvania's education website uh, in the chat box, but um, I encourage you to reach out to us um, uh, if you have questions or would like more information. I certainly commend you to the website where you can see a lot more detail about all of our different strategies, um, and I thank you and um, uh, our two hosts, uh, again, for providing the opportunity for me to present to you today. You bet. Thank you so much, Beth. That was really interesting. There's so much going on, and, and I can tell that there's a, a foment in the chat box. There are lots of questions, and I promise that we've reserved some time um, at the end of today's call to address uh, as many of those questions as we can. But thank you so much Great. for sharing. Um, thank you. I am now going to turn things over to Paul Fleming from the Tennessee Department of Education about his state's equity philosophy and sort of how it's um, – embedded in its Leaders for Equity playbook. Um, before I hand over the mic, though, I'm going to um, move over into the presentation section, um, a file share pod, um, where you can download the Tennessee Leaders for Equity playbook as well as today's presentation um, slide deck. So all you do is uh, go over there and select uh, the file you want and then download. All right, Paul, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Caitlin and Carmen and Beth, and for everyone being on the webinar this afternoon. Um, like Beth in Pennsylvania, we have a lot happening in Tennessee regarding ESSA and also equity, more importantly, perhaps, uh, around accountability. But I wanted to focus, for Tennessee, the focus on leadership. You know, principals have uh, the second biggest influence on in, on uh, in school achievement, only surpassed by teachers. And so wanted to just... Uh, walk through a little bit of our approach in Tennessee that encapsulates a lot of the ESSA and state strategic plan priorities in Tennessee, but also through the lens of leadership. One thing that's not on the slides is, uh, Caitlin referenced, is we are actually using our Title IIA, 3% set aside for nine regional pipeline models for aspiring leaders with an equity focus. And we're excited that that's going to train about 160 principals a year, or aspiring leaders, through the Title IIA uh, uh, SF funds for Tennessee, and we formed a transformational alliance that actually is the platform for all nine of these regional pipeline models to connect to and receive support from the state as they build out their uh, multi-year pipeline models. So uh, I think that's one key piece that SF really afforded us that opportunity aligned to SF, I mean, yeah, aligned to equity because we are interested in making sure in these pipeline regional models of districts that they think about equity in the placement of principals in schools in terms of best fit and to serving the needs of our most vulnerable students. Um, one of just to start with a slide, because I think like Pennsylvania and a lot of states, there are similar demographics. So we actually track our high school graduates where they go after high school in Tennessee. And you can see here from our class of 2014, uh, and I particularly relate to this because I'm a high school, high school principal here in Nashville before joining the state. And you can see that for this cohort, um, about a third do not go into any type of post-secondary program. No industry certification, no four-year, no two-year, no technical college. But we also have about 40% going on to four-year, 24% uh, on two-year. And then you can see, though, for our economically disadvantaged students, that students not having an opportunity, when we talk about opportunity gaps for any type of secondary. Here's the problem. They are making $10,000 annually per year, and that is pretty much in real terms as a challenge when we think about wanting, like that said, to have post-secondary pathways that actually start in elementary in order to get to post-secondary in a way that could so Tennessee just tried to kind of put a, a flag in the ground and say, this is our vision that we will be, you know, six years to uh, 
environment where we only have one chart. We're focused on all students, uh, all moving in a significant <laughs> I'm going to interrupt Paul and remind folks that if they're not speaking, we'd really appreciate it if you would mute your phone so that we can hear um, the speakers. Thank you so much. We we do appreciate it. Sure. All right, Paul, back to you. Yeah, sure. So you can see that, you know, this is where we're heading is is the real stakes of, of providing all students with some significant post <laughs> um, that Beth had also laid out. And so these are some of our challenges in Tennessee, right? How do we really equip teachers with the knowledge and support? Uh, because the goal line has changed. We know it's no longer about high school graduation. And how do we embed then, uh, as Carmen mentioned in the beginning, this powerful notion of, of equity into the DNA of every district and every school to reach every mm. student? And I believe that's uh, the difference that we need to think differently about our systems and about our strategies and our support tools so we're not replicating what has happened in the past. That creates equality, but not equity. And so as you can see in our challenges, one of the things I'll talk about is this Leaders for Equity playbook that tries to we need some different strategies to reach the outcomes of impacting all students uh, with that. So it's been covered before, but you know we believe in Tennessee, it's, it's a student-centered concept when we talk about equity that it addresses uh, systematically student needs and again, we're talking about systems and moving from efforts to a systems approach. Mm. All students have access and opportunities uh, for closing these opportunity gaps, especially with some of our underserved subgroups. As I mentioned, that economic reality of making $10,000 a year is pretty sober. Um, in Tennessee, we had a strategic plan in 2015 that predated our ESSA plan. And you can see it's really through our model to say that we want district schools to exemplify both excellence and equity, such that all students are equipped with the knowledge and skills. Uh, and so that's really impacting everything we do from a vision standpoint, when equity is not just a an add-on. I think that's the other piece that needs to be thought about carefully for district schools and states, are how do we have equity be actually systematically um, operationalized as opposed to an add-on program as well. And just to quickly show you, we have six kind of strategic priorities in Tennessee. These are our six, and equity is really threaded all the way across that continuum. Standards, accountability and assessment, early foundations, high school, all student support, support and district Thank empowerment. You. So this idea of, of uh, well, I haven't, I haven't texted yet, so I'll text. Priorities that are there. Uh, my the vision is the teachers and leaders. In the comment uh, section, so that it's so that's what I'm doing. I think we're still getting some background, and folks can mute uh, the important. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing the webinar that I was practicing. So <laughs> we also have uh, this idea of how are we supporting equity, recognizing that many students have obstacle factors that are uh, right. often difficult yeah, to uh, reconcile. So we know that what are the in-school factors around public schooling are critical towards leveraging equitable student outcomes. And that's, that's really key. So we believe that really all states, districts, and schools can focus on equity through goal setting, right, through these clear expectations for leaders and teachers, through important policies, and through funding priorities as I think Carmen mentioned okay. in the beginning, to think about what does that really look like to provide uh, equitable resources for all students that often disrupt the notion of equality. And that's where our playbook, as I'll mention in a moment, is trying to capitalize on some of those strategies. Um, so when we're looking at school leaders, we believe school leaders are really the, bent, the gatekeeper for uh, what happens in schools. and. The idea that school leaders have the opportunity to ensure right uh, high up, you know, high outcomes, uh, creating inclusive multicultural school environments by disrupting some of these practices, and also cultivating unique gifts, talents, and interests right of all students, and that's a lot on a principle. But we think that if we're tra we have to train them differently and put equity at the forefront, that we will make this happen uh, in a way that hasn't been done before. So I wanted to just share this resource. This was a year-long project through the Wallace Foundation, and we had 10 state teams that came together. We were one of those state teams. And 
I would say just a couple things to preface it. One, we believe this playbook is applicable not just in Tennessee, because if you look at these seven commitments, as Beth mentioned, um, like Pennsylvania, we share those first five uh, in our accountability plan, but we also believe number six and seven, for example, around cultural competencies and community allies, even though they're not an accountability, are equally important for creating equitable outcomes for all students. And we also think uh, that the, the playbook is a way to capture in one place, uh, almost the Walmart approach, <laughs> right, through uh, one source, uh, a reference for parents, for community members, for school board members, for district leaders and principals, ideas and strategies across these seven commitments. So our theory of action, as you can see, is that uh, we believe that if they take action and make these commitments to one or more of these, these areas, then there will be positive significant shifts related to equity. Um, you can see, again, these first five are in both our strategic plan and our ESSA plan and are very impactful for uh, how we believe districts and schools can operate. The playbook is structured so that there are actions for each one of those commitments at four levels, the school level, the district level, or school leader level, the district leader level, the school board level, and also the community leader level as well. Um, we also have a definition because we believe if the leaders need to think about equity, we all need to be on the same page. And so the idea is working to eliminate these achievement gaps to ensure success for all students. Uh, by also identifying and addressing personal and institutional bias and barriers. And there's a section in the playbook around really the equity shifts that have to happen uh, around mindsets that need to be thought of and discussed before taking action. And so for each one of those commitments, there's an actual uh, misconception around this area, an actual equity shift about uh, what happens when you make that shift, and then research to back up, and I'll show you in a moment what that looks like uh, for each one of those areas, because those mindset shifts, we believe, are important when we're thinking around equity uh, as well. So the playbook, you know, is developed over a year, and we're seeing it as, as ultimately it's a flexible support tool uh, in a way that addresses current challenges and not to put more ornaments on the Christmas tree, so to speak. We're not talking about adding programs. We're talking about how you analyze your data at a district level or a state level or a school level, and then really hone in on one or more of these uh, equity commitments and think about the actions that are most applicable to you. Uh, also knowing that you need to have these conversations around the equity shifts that are in, laid out in that section. Uh, so you think about using these selectively so that they're not um, taken on all at once, and uh, really think about how are, you, how are they being informed by, by school data district data. So again, it's not an add-on approach, uh, which, which is there. So this is just one example. So, you know, decreasing chronic absenteeism, I believe it, across the country is certainly now a very uh, impactful area of focus. Um, one of the school leader actions is to establish this kind of school-wide system for the early identification and prevention of above-average absenteeism. There's also a community action listed, thinking about how do you enlist support by community, re community resources. Um, especially around areas like clothing that might keep students from attending school, right, or supplies that they need. We also then in some couples and put the research into each area. This is a pretty compelling piece if you look at that, even for sixth graders, uh, you know, attending school more than 90% of the time uh, increased the, the uh, high school on time graduation point. So, you know, this, this point of it's, uh, there are in school factors that are controllable around each one of these seven areas. Another one, and Beth touched on this with the, her, the ESSA plan in Pennsylvania, uh, we are intent on all of the early post-secondary opportunities that students that have access to it, if you see the, the, the research at the bottom, that we know low-income students are actually on a much greater chance of succeeding in post-secondary when they have access and opportunity to take uh, a dual enrollment, a dual credit course, an AP course in the high school setting. And so this was another uh, commitment I just wanted to highlight around what are opportunities for districts to pursue agreements. We've even had some really innovative rural districts now 
inviting their community colleges to to actually come and, and teach on campus at the high school rather than sending the students to the community college and uh, making that happen in a way that's, that's very different than the status quo. Uh, but we also wanted to see here school board members as well having their own set of actions to think about funding and, and putting the stake in the ground about making a, a, a community commitment to uh, the idea of these, these school board or these actions around, uh, around EPSOs. We call EPSOs or early post-secondary uh, opportunities. So we hope that, you know, it's a resource so far we are, are using with superintendents um, to train them on principles. Uh, in fact, the National Urban League is requesting the playbook for each one of their chapters around the country. So we see multiple uses, and again, I want to re uh, reiterate the, even though this is Tennessee data, we are hopeful that this can be used across settings, right, settings in different states and districts across the country. Uh, because we believe that these areas are, are, are important to focus on and then those corresponding uh, actions as well. I would say just to end, uh, we're also in Tennessee fortunate we have state funding to focus on three areas of the principal pipeline. One is training new uh, aspiring leaders that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Um, second around recruiting retention bonuses for turnaround school leaders, and then third, really providing opportunities for current rural principals to uh, have an opportunity to come together and be uh, forming a network, of a rural network for, for professional learning. So even though this is fairly focused on leadership, we believe that this is an important part of our ESSA and equity plan in Tennessee is to really uh, leverage school leaders to drive equity, as I mentioned they are also the gatekeepers in their schools. Um, like you bored by your phone. I'm sorry. So I'm going to turn it back to Caitlin because I believe at this point I want to uh, have a again uh, interesting to hear from folks on, on the different areas of focus uh, this time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That was great. We really appreciate um, the thoughtfulness of the uh, philosophy and plans <laughs> that you shared. So um, at this point, we have a number of questions that have already been posted in the uh, chat box. So um, let's see. Uh, I will go through some of them. Um, Denise has said, how do parents assess the dashboard presentation? Most of them are very confusing. Um, and there was uh, some agreement from Arnold as well. So. Um, Beth, maybe you can talk to us about uh, some of the strategies that Pennsylvania is taking to make the dashboard information more, you know, easier to understand, more intuitive, that sort of thing. Well, we're very cognizant of that issue, um, and we've had uh, a number of stakeholder uh, activities with parents, focus groups, and that sort of thing to try and, um, first of all, in the first instance, uh, create uh, uh, what the pages look like and how they flow um, to make those easier to understand. Um, I think there is going to be work to do both for the department and individual uh, LEAs and schools to uh, take steps to help their families and communities understand the story that the report cards are telling. So. Um, for example, if a particular principal wanted to uh, write a, a, a one-page or two-page memo that calls attention to both the, the good news uh, revealed by uh, their <coughs> test scores as well as acknowledges the challenges that might be revealed by data. So I think that we will do what we can to help maybe by offering templates um, that uh, schools and districts can use in a shorter form to kind of summarize and call attention to what is in the data um, and help people look at it. Um, it, it it's going to be a challenge, but, um, you know, we, as, as I said earlier, I, I don't think the answer to the complexity of the presentation is to eliminate the complexity and just have a single summative school or a grade. Um, the, the goal is to help folks, the goal is to help folks um, to see the data that they're most interested in. And that data will change depending on what your constituency is and what your 
how old your child is and um, why you're looking at the data. Are you a school board member? Are you a taxpayer? Are you looking to move into the district? Are you looking to advocate in front of your principal or school board for um, ways to spend money? So there's a lot of learning to do, and I think that uh, virtually everybody in the um, in the array of constituencies has a role to play in helping folks understand uh, all of this data. Thanks, Beth. Um, there's a related question. Again, it's about uh, the role of parents, and I, I think this is posed for Paul. Um, PD for leaders in the uh, leader uh, playbook. Does, does it include parents? Is there a way to link parents into equity strategies? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we're, we're coming at it in a couple different ways. Like that, we have an ongoing accountability working group that includes principals and superintendents, but we also have parents on that working group so that when we are, like Pennsylvania, creating our dashboard and, uh, and school level and district level accountability reports, parents at the elementary, middle, and high school are getting say into what that format looks like and what is more easily readable and understandable. And I think that's really helped in our redesign of our dashboard and also on our um, kind of our public facing report card for every school and every district to really have parent input. So that's gone a long way. We also had a lot of parents on our uh, parent groups and parent focus groups on our ESSA plan uh, feedback, you know, groups with that. Um, on the leadership side, we don't have parents formally involved in, you know, so far in the, the PD, other than they mentioned the training of these principals now. Uh, all these nine regional pipeline programs that we funded through Title IIA have to be embedded in their training of these aspiring principals, the notion of um, parent networks, parent partnerships, family partnerships as part of the training, if that makes sense. So. We don't like have an advisory <laughs> around leadership, but through the requirements of accessing the Title IIA funds, these nine regional pipeline models have to be thinking around parent engagement and community outlines, like we mentioned in the playbook, um, as part of their training for these aspiring principals. The playbook will also be required for the, these regional pipeline, principal pipeline models as well to be used as a training tool which addresses then that kind of community and uh, family engagement piece. Great. Thanks so much. Um, it looks like you're – go ahead. I, I had some additional uh, comments about family engagement. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of a small number of states that is uh, working with, in a community of practice facilitated by CCSSO. Um, the ultimate goal for this group is to develop a, a family engagement uh, framework K to 12, uh, that could be a resource for, uh, for schools and districts about all of the different opportunities and ways for um, schools to, to engage families. And that, that sounds like a very big subject, and, um, it is, and it is, and we certainly don't want to create a document that then is going to just sit on the shelf and not be useful to everyone. Um, but I think there is, a, there is good work going on um, about uh, – uh, bias um, and how uh, schools are not welcoming the families um, and there's a lot of work that we're doing particularly in our school the development of our school improvement model that brings families to the table um, as they go through their needs assessment and develop uh, their school improvement plan responsive to the needs assessment um, so that that's only one place but that's a very important place to make sure that families uh, and parents are engaged. Um, our community school model, and we do have uh, state work going on to support um, and provide an opportunity for collaboration of the various community school models that are uh, starting to spring up um, around the state. I think that one of the things about, fam about family and parent engagement is that under ESSA, um, it's not an add-on, it's not voluntary, it's, uh, we need to change and are working to change the paradigm so that uh, parents and families are always invited to participate and have a seat at the table, rather than uh, that being a choice that you get to make. Um, so I think that is infused in our ESSA plan, and, and it's challenging, um, but I think that it is starting to become the norm rather than um, the exception. Thanks, Beth. 
Um, at this point, we, you know, still have a little bit of time. We, we do want to share a few action items with you, but we have a bit more time. If you have uh, any questions and would like to ask them aloud, please feel free. Have I used enough wait time? <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, in any case, please feel free to continue asking questions in the chat box, chat box if you'd rather not speak up. But um, we'll go ahead and move on then to um, this next slide with uh, Carmen, um, who will share some action items with us um, for state, district, schools, and teachers. Yes. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Paul, and, um, and Beth as well for your presentation. So just to kind of wrap it all up into some nice action items, um, how can we use ESSA to reinforce equity? Many of these strategies you heard from uh, today from Beth and, and um, Paul in terms of what's going on in their respective states. But for SCAs, LEAs, and school administrators, um, counteracting racial inequality and unequal resource allocation by directing the use of the different title funds and creating programs and pathways for students educators and leaders, um, developing Grow Your Own initiative when it comes to recruiting teachers and retaining educators um, uh, to ensure that local talent remains in hard to staff areas. A review school and district policies for equity. Many times we're not aware that the outcome that we're seeing, whether it be with um, disproportionality and discipline or with um, any other number of inequities that we see in outcomes, that a lot of times those come from uh, gaps in understanding and policy. So removing some of those um, ambiguities, uh, ambiguities in policies, and, and, and reviewing those, and making sure that um, everything, uh, everyone has the same understanding um, for student success. Set equitable accountability goals um, for all students and for the different subgroups of students. Create family engagement frameworks. We just heard the work that um, the CCSSO is doing and um, that many states are doing, that Pennsylvania is doing, and Tennessee is doing, um, but making sure that families and parents are included in the work um, that's happening around ESSA and equity. And then for educators, in your classrooms, employing a student-centered approach where students are active seekers of information, um, and not just passive receivers. Um, create a positive classroom climate where students feel related, they feel like they belong, which leads to feeling competence and, um, and autonomy and motivation and engagement and, and all of a sudden outcomes, positive outcomes that we all want to see. Providing opportunities for all students to learn by giving students intellectually challenging assignments. Using instructional materials that consider multiple cultural and linguistic perspectives, uh, monitoring the performance of students and different subgroups of students and doing something and acting when uh, inequities um, start to creep out. And then communicate with families regularly, not just when um, there's an issue, but when there are um, positive things to report. And just trying to every day work towards developing those relationships, positive relationships with families and parents. Thank you very much, Carmen. Um, Carmen is now going to tell you about a really cool event that's coming up, and I'm going to post the link to the registration uh, in the chat box. So, Carmen, you want to tell us a little bit about this uh, um, equity breakfast? Yes, yes, I do. So, on July 18th, um, the Center for Education and Equity at MAC, along with the United States Department of Education Office uh, for Civil Rights, will be hosting our um, very first breakfast institute entitled Start Your Day Right, Build District Capacity, to Stop Racial Harassment and Bullying. Um, the event will be held at Temple University on July 18th from 8.30 to 1. We will have a keynote address by Dr. Richard Milner, who is a professor at University of Pittsburgh. He's also the author of Start Where You Are But Don't Stay There and Race Into Class. Um, and we'll have some breakout sessions where different uh, district superintendents will be um, will be uh, discussing 
some of the challenges and successes that they've had around this particular issue. Um, the registration link is there, um, and also Caitlin just posted it in the chat box. And uh, space is limited, so we're asking everyone to register by July 2nd. And for more information, uh, go to the link and read more about it and also register. We'd love to see you. Thanks, Herman. It looks like a really interesting event. Um, I also want to let you know that uh, included in the PowerPoint, which you can download in the uh, download file uh, to the top left of your screen, um, there's also contact information for the uh, CEE and uh, for the ARC. So we want to thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you to our presenters. We really have learned so much and covered so much ground, and um, we could take a few more hours to <laughs> hash some of this stuff out, but uh, please know that if you want to get in touch with us, we're available. Both of our organizations are um, here to provide technical assistance to states and districts, so please feel free to reach out. Um, and also, thank you very much both to Beth and Paul for sharing the details of your equity work um, in your, your state. Um, it's very informative, interesting work, and uh, it'll be exciting to see where it goes over the years. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, today's recording will uh, be posted to the ARC YouTube site, um, and you'll be able to find it on the ARC website. Uh, we'll also provide that link to uh, the Center for Education Equity as well. And we'll be sending you a uh, brief uh, evaluation survey via email shortly. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good afternoon.